Come on, can we put our hands together for kindness, y'all? Anybody thankful to be kind this morning? Well, hey, it's so glad uh, to see you. Welcome to church. You look good. Look like you got a good, good night rest. Anybody woke up this morning and said, I could use a little bit of extra rest. Awesome. Great. Great, great, great crowd. Good to see everybody. Glad you got some rest. Hey, if you're new to our community, welcome. I'm so glad that you took some time to join us uh, on behalf of our team, our dream teamers and our lead team and our just overseers and our board and all these people that are helping make this church happen. Uh, we want to say welcome. We are opening this church January 23rd officially at the Dunkirk Movieplex. We're getting excited, y'all. And, uh, you know, I, I, I want to shout out just a couple men in our church. It's been great. Uh, interacting with more and more locals. You know, my wife and I have been about here about a year now. And so we're, we, we're getting to know people, we're understanding people, we're loving people. Uh, but I'm just grateful for the men of this house. So many men have stepped up and said, hey, I wanna help like build like with my hands, not just like shake hands, but like I, if you need help building stuff. So we've got a group of guys that are gonna be building our platform uh, inside the movie theater. So the movie theater is a movie theater, so there's no stage for it. So we've got a group of guys that are actually going to start this month building a stage that we're going to be able to keep there all week long. And uh, just excited to see what God's going to do. You know, something happens when you actually build platforms. Everyone wants to stand on platforms. No one wants to build them. I'm just grateful that we're a church that's going to build platforms where God can get lifted up. And uh, it's a great thing. Had a great time last night. The Miracle on Main Street, if you were here for Donia. Love uh, meeting some people and, and watching the parade. You know, there was a parade a couple months ago uh, in the square. And my wife and I are walking from our house. They're like, hurry up. You're going to miss the parade. By the time we got there, we sure did. We missed it. Uh, but we were there last night. It was awesome to connect with some community and uh, do that. Hey, if you're ready to get in the Word today, open up your Bibles if you can to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And uh, we are coming into the last month of 2021, y'all. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to finish this year. I'm ready for a new year. I'm ready for this year to conclude and for God to do something new. And so uh, for this month, we're going to take some time to look in the Gospels, look at the person of Jesus, spend a little bit of time trying to figure out what God is speaking to in this day and age in our community. Um, while you're turning your Bibles, can we just shout out our kids team this morning, y'all? Can we honor our kids team? Our first kids church service is happening upstairs, and uh, we're excited about that. A team of about 10 people have committed to serving with our babies and middle, uh, uh, our toddlers and our elementary school kids. And so we're, we're really just thrilled, man. That's why it's so quiet in here, because none of the kids are here. <laughs> I figured it out. John chapter 1. We're going to start reading in verse 9. When you're ready, say, I'm ready. Here reads the word of the Lord. The writer John says, The true light, which gives light to everyone. Speaking of Jesus, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him and who believed in his name, he gave the right, someone say right. He gave the right to become children of God. I want to spend time in these four verses today as we uh, go to God's word. And if you're new to the Bible, um, it can be intimidating at times. It can be confusing at times. But when you do it with community and you open it up together, something kind of just sparks. The Bible is not, wasn't written to confuse us. It was written to equip us and connect us with God. Religion is less about what we can do for God and more about understanding what God has done for us. For some reason, we've tripped, we've kind of flipped that. We've made it about how much can I know, how much can I do, how much can I see. Our church is built on the gospel, which is the good news of what Jesus did for us. Because of that, what we can do for him. And so I want to look at just this verse right here, verse 9. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Let's pray. Father, help us today. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your awareness, God. You're aware of everything we struggle with. You're aware of everything we go through. You're aware of the emotions we feel, of the reactions we have. Today, I pray that as we open your word, you would open us up. You would see who we really are. We would, we would come to you honestly, openly. Have your way today in Jesus' name. And if you believe it, would you say amen and amen. Can you do me a favor before you uh, jump in? Could you turn to someone and just say, don't miss the point. Don't miss the point. Don't miss the point. Uh, as I 
became a dad this year, I realized that I forget a lot of things. Anybody here forget things? And you just forget your keys, forget your car, forget your relationships. Don't forget that. Uh, but just, just forgetful. That's me. I was coming up to the gas station the other day, and this always happens to me. I don't know if this happens to you, but I get to the gas pump, and every single time, I don't remember what side my gas pump is on. So I was with my wife. I was with one of, one of our friends, and we're driving, and I'm like, you know, I pulled up, and I'm like, oh, this always happens. What side is the gas pump on? And our friend in the back seat, she goes, why don't you just look at the arrow? And I said, the arrow? What do you mean, look at the arrow? I'm looking for my gas pump. She goes, on the dashboard. And sure enough, I don't know if this is in your car, but if you look at the dashboard next to the gas pump, sometimes there's actually a little arrow that tells you your gas pump's on the left, your gas pump's on the right. And it was like I had just discovered gold or something. Like the entire time I had been driving and right there in front of me was the answer to the thing I was looking for. Isn't it funny how some things, the thing right in front of us we need is not the first thing we often see? Like, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but sometimes in our desires, we desire things and we think our desires need to be fulfilled like way out there. And we're like, surely God couldn't use me where I'm at or couldn't do something where I'm at. And we kind of like miss the main point. Not that we got to get to a place for God to use us, but that God wants to use us here and now. That sometimes we're looking for the finished product when God wants to show us just the very first step. We're reading about a man who has been, people have been waiting for him. John chapter 1 is one of the most prolific chapters of scripture, I think. Um, If you're familiar with the gospels, there's four of them. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Everyone say that with me. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. One more time. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, that's enough. Um, But basically, there are four guys that all gave their their view on what Jesus did. Matthew, he is one of the 12 disciples. He's a tax collector. Matthew was really good with numbers. He was really good with keeping track of things. So it makes sense that Matthew's gospel is the longest, 28 chapters. He goes through all the genealogy of Jesus, like he's into the details, you know. And then you got Mark. Mark was actually written by Peter. Peter was telling John Mark, can you tell the story for me? And Mark is the shortest gospel, 16 chapters. He wants us to get to the cross as soon as possible. He's like, let's get to the forgiveness of Jesus because I think Peter still had a little guilt for denying Jesus. And so as he's writing, he's like, let's just get there as quick as we can so we can get the forgiveness of sin. Luke was a doctor, not an original disciple, would have heard about it from somebody else. So all the physical miracles of Jesus, can I teach for a second? All the physical miracles of Jesus are in Luke because he's a doctor. So all the healings, the arms stretching out, all that stuff. It was a doctor that said, I need to know that. John is a little different though. John is weird. John is the youngest of the disciples. He wrote his gospel later than anybody else. He probably would have had a chance to read the other three at first. And so he sits down and he starts penning his and he's like, this has got to be different. He doesn't start with, let me tell you about the genealogy of Jesus, or let me tell you about the redemption of Jesus, or let me tell you about, you know, the healings of Jesus. He starts by saying, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. In the beginning, what does that sound like? Genesis chapter one. Remember the first book of the Bible, in the beginning, God. So the moment John writes in the beginning, he's connecting with his Jewish audience. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all tell a different story about the same person. Imagine it's like a four-way intersection and there is an accident that takes place right in the middle of it. John is on this corner and he says, oh, here's what I saw. Matthew's on this corner and he says, oh, here's what I saw. Luke is over there and Mark's over there. They're seeing the same thing but they're just telling it differently. John starts writing in a way that says, if you are Jewish, you've probably been waiting for the Messiah. You've probably been waiting for God's son. The only reason John writes is to make sure that the Jewish people don't miss the main point. They are looking for something that Jesus is not going to come to fulfill. Jesus is coming from God, and, and, and the Jews were expecting Jesus to come and just take everybody out and take over. You ever wish for a God like that that would just come and just take care of all your enemies and give you your raise and give you the stuff you want so you can move on with your life? The Jewish people were looking for a warrior. Instead, the king came as a baby in a manger. Babies can't do anything by themselves. But for some reason, God's hope for humanity came in the form of an infant. He didn't come with a sword. He didn't come with a military. He didn't come with legislation. He didn't come with a bunch of people in his corner. It wasn't a crazy mob. No, it was a baby in a manger. 
almost telling us that sometimes what we expect from God has a big deal in how we follow the things of God. Expectation is crucial in our world today. Uh, if you don't have a healthy expectation for things to happen, you'll probably be disappointed. I've, I've learned this in my own life. My desire for God can easily dwindle. You ever felt like your just passion wasn't there like it used to be? Am I the only one like, yeah, I go to church and I love the Lord, but like sometimes I'm in it, other times I'm not. Like sometimes I feel it, sometimes it's in my spirit, sometimes I feel like I could take on the world, and other times I'm like, all right, God, if you really don't do anything, I guess I'm done. One of my mentors says, the God you see is the God you get, meaning how you see God determines your relationship with him. If you see God as a scorekeeper, every time you come to him, you'll be talking about your score. God, you know, I did this and I did that and I did this because in your mind, God is a scorekeeper. If you see him as a father, maybe you come to him like a child does. I don't need any rules. I come to my dad because I know my dad's gonna make time for me. Maybe you see God as a manager and you're more so like, as long as I can just keep my shift and clock in, clock out and do my thing. But friends, however you see him will play a role in how you follow him. That's why we go to the scriptures. That's why we look at like stories like the gospel of John because John was writing and he was saying, you guys are expecting like this rescuer that's just not gonna deal with any of your problems and come and just take you away from it all. And John actually writes and says, no, no friends, this is God incarnate. This is God himself that came to the earth. God himself came and walked among us. And when God is in our lives, we ought to have a healthy expectation for what he's going to do. Someone say expectation. Uh, we are in a season of Advent right now where we are counting down the days till Christmas. And uh, technically, in a religious uh, uh, context, Advent is an opportunity to prepare our hearts for the coming of Jesus. If you're raised Presbyterian or Catholic or maybe a little bit more conservative religious tradition, Advent might be a bigger deal to you. Uh, but Advent is just meant to prepare us for the coming of Jesus, that we should have an active expectation in our hearts. Like when you showed up to church today, are you expecting God to, to talk to you? Are you expecting to leave with your emotions strengthened? Are you expecting for God to show up in worship and, and just bring your soul to a place of health? Or are you just going to church because like, I gotta go to church? Because the way you show up, the expectation you have, uh, it is the preparation for what God's going to do. I say it like this. Expectation is the breeding ground for miracles. God moves at the level of our expectation. If we expect him to heal somebody, like we genuinely expect it, he'll do it. But if we kind of say, well, I don't want to expect too much from God. Because, you know, you ever try to protect God with your prayers? Like, don't pray a prayer too big because if God doesn't do it, he looks bad. I've prayed prayers like that. I've been like, well, God, you know, if you want us just to touch the village of Fredonia, like we'll come out and just, it's about Fredonia. We're here for Fredonia. And then all of a sudden these cats started coming from Dunkirk. And I'm like, well, God, if you want to, you know, touch the city of Fredonia and Dunkirk. And then, you know, people started coming from Forceville. They're like, what about Forceville? I'm like, well, you know, God, if you want to touch it. And before that, I say, Lord, I pray for the whole county this morning in the name of Jesus, all 36 towns, villages, and hamlets. I got a list of them in my room. I just pray over all those little hamlets too in the name of Jesus, because I'm expecting something different. I don't want to play church as usual. I don't want to play Christian as usual. I'm expecting active Christianity. Because Sunday shouldn't be the day we get filled up. It should be the day that confirms what God has been doing all week long. And then we gather together and we leave together and we move forward. What keeps us from being active, though? Isn't it? What would you say? Probably like distraction. Yeah. I, I, I believe one focused believer can do more than 10 distracted believers anytime. Like one believer that is focused on the main thing, set on on the right thing, they can accomplish more then 10 people that are just kind of like hanging out. Yeah. Jesus has this line in Revelation chapter three where he says, I have spit you out of my mouth because you are neither hot nor cold. Y'all heard that text before? He says, you're lukewarm. What is he saying? He's like, you're not on fire for me. Like you're not telling people about me or like, you know, actively practicing the spiritual practices, you know, prayer, Sabbath, scripture, like the practices of, of our faith. Like you're not really doing that, but you're also not like not believing in me. And so it's like, you got faith. It's not like it's like crazy faith, but it's, it's kind of like just lazy faith. You know, it's like, I got faith, but I'm just kind of here. And I believe if we're gonna touch this region, it starts with us as a launch team being prepared 
to expect big things for God. Because if the enemy, the thing is, the enemy cannot destroy us. That's a good place to say amen. The enemy, the enemy cannot destroy us. So, but he can distract us. What did he do with Eve? Eve shows up and he says, did God really say you couldn't have any of these trees? And the Bible, any of this fruit? And the Bible says, when Eve saw the fruit and she saw that it was good for eating, it became desirable to her. Three-step process. So she saw it, she thought about what it would be like, and then all of a sudden she wanted it. That's how the enemy works. He doesn't get you to want it right away. He gets you to see it. Yeah, don't look at that. Look at this. He knows what you like. He knows how to tempt you. And if he can get you to look at it and keep looking at it, that's when it becomes desirable. And I'm in a season of my life, friends, where I'm asking the Holy Spirit to strip out any impure desires and for God to ignite again some passion. Come on, some of y'all, you remember like 30 years ago, that one song or that one revival meeting you went to and you felt it and you were like, ah, that was the moment. I'm asking him to do it again. I'm asking him to build again, to try again, to open me up again, to be used for who he is. So what John tells us is that this king that's coming into the world, what's the first three lines here? The first three words he says, he says, he's the true light, which gives light to everything. So what should I expect from Jesus? What should I expect from a relationship with him? Well, first of all, a relationship with Jesus, it brings light. That's the first thing you should know. When we're going through this uh, four verses today, a relationship with Jesus brings light. Number one, a relationship, with, uh, a relationship with Jesus brings light. We just read it, verse nine, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Why does the writer have to tell us that he is the true light? Well, that means that there is such a thing as false lights. Lights that present themselves to be a good way forward but maybe die out once you actually start taking steps. Lights that actually look like they're going to illuminate your path. You know, like careers. You know, God, God gives us our careers. He, he definitely blesses our careers. He wants us to find strength in our careers. But if my identity is built on my career, what happens if I lose my career? Oh, so what we do is we say, well, I'll just get into a relationship then. Let me just find the right one. You know, the one. Like, let me find the one. I know God has someone for me. And then we get into a relationship and we're like, this is what my life is about. This is my relationship. This is who I am. And then that fails. And then we lose ourselves all over again. John says the true light is in Jesus. And this is a light that does not go out. Y'all remember this little light of mine. I'm going to let it. Show. Okay. I just want to make sure. The light of our faith is meant to be an active daily part of what we do. Uh, my wife and I, we're so lucky. We have uh, someone bought us when we had our baby shower. They bought us a baby Brezza. It's like a Keurig for babies. Okay. We put our bottles under there, press the button. It shoots it out. No more mixing bottles. None of that stuff. It's incredible. Here's the only problem. Our baby Brezza is in a separate room from our bedroom. So in the middle of the night, you know, baby wakes up, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, oh, she's hungry, you know, so I'll shoot down to the kitchen real quick and, and make the bottle and then come back upstairs and, you know, feed her and she goes back to sleep. And, and typically, it's common for me to do this in the dark. Have you ever tried to walk around in the dark in your house before? You know your house, you know your rooms and stuff, and so what do you do? You kind of come in and kind of like just feel your way around and then, you know, you're just wanting to make sure that like everything is everything and everything's good and, and then, okay, I did it and I did what I needed to do and I come back into the light. See, because when we live in the darkness, you have to live by feeling. You have to live by what you feel. You have to live by your feelings and can I sense it? Can I feel it? Can I touch you? Can we spend some time together first? Like, do I really know what's going on? And we, we live with our feeling in mind. When the light is a place where we live by faith. We live because we see it. This is why Paul said we walk by faith, not by sight. Because the light of Jesus illuminates us in a way that's beyond just physical sight. You have to feel when you lead with your feelings. Following Jesus will allow us to get into the light. Someone say light. Light, light exposes things too. Did y'all know that? 2020, the year... Uh, that everything changed it was March. I think it was like the second week, and 
you know, there was talks of LA shutting down and things were kind of preparing that way. We had a backup plan in place in case we couldn't have church. What are we going to do with these couple hundred people and how are we going to kind of, kind of reach out to them? And, and once everything locked down, I remember being in prayer, like the third day of quarantine. And, um, and I just remember the word of the Lord was, was Luke chapter eight, where it says, and everything that's hidden will be brought to light. That's what Jesus said. He said, the light's going to come and everything that is hidden will be brought out. Meaning when the light comes, there is nothing you can hide. And I don't know if you noticed this, but all through 2020, it was like all of a sudden this stuff started coming out. Well, this person was actually doing this and this official did this and this school is doing this and this pastor never did. And, and all of a sudden all this stuff got exposed. Because when you commit to following Jesus, you have to be okay with your dirt being seen by others. You have to be okay with him exposing things. You know, I'm a pastor. y'all. I'm 31 years old. This is the first time we're starting a church. It is the last time we're starting a church. Amen. Amen. But like, there's going to be some exposing in our leadership. There's going to be moments where some of y'all are going to look at us and say, oh, I thought you guys were perfect. And that's fine. You're entitled to think we're perfect. Like, people are going to put you on a pedestal. People are going to put you on a pedestal every day. It's up to you to take yourself off. Okay? It doesn't matter what position you hold in your workplace, in your job, in, in, in whatever it is. People are naturally going to put you on this standard. And my wife and I have just determined we're going to be secure leaders. And if someone says, like, I had a conversation with someone this morning, they're like, we need to talk about that. That was weird. I just got to be like, okay, right, because light exposes flaws. And it's okay. It's okay. God can't put you back together till you admit you're broken. And that is what the gospel of John does. He says light comes from Jesus. And I just love that idea of light. Um, C.S. Lewis has a great quote. I want to show you this. I'll move on. He says, I believe in Christianity like I believe in the sun. And he says, not because I see the sun, but because by it, I see everything else. Huh? Think about it. <laughs> he says, I believe in God like I believe in the sun. Not because you can't look directly in the sun. You burn your eyes out. The Bible says that no one has seen God, but him who has made him known, Jesus Christ. So we don't see God active in everyday life like straight on, but we see everything else because of his presence differently. Does that make sense? So I can't really tell all the time, hmm, I'm not sure. I'm very careful to say, here's what God is saying. You better know that's what God is saying before you tell somebody, here's what the Lord is saying. Um, but because of him, I can see other things. More light gives me more exposure, and that allows me to grow and become more like Jesus. So Jesus brings light. Number two, the gospel this is something you should expect from John's gospel. The gospel reveals God's presence here and now. Meaning the good news of Jesus is not a future thing we're talking about. Yes, heaven is coming. Yes, eternity will be great. But friends, heaven is not over there. The Bible says one day all, the earth will be made new and that heaven will come down to earth and it'll make a new creation. And that's what will exist in forever. For so, some reason that we have this obsession with heaven, let's get there. I want to get to heaven. I want him to take me out already. I want him to go. I want to go. I want to go to glory. And glory is good, but friends, there's also something happening here and now. God's presence is active now. Verse 10 says, he was in the world. This is Jesus Christ. He was in the world. And the world was made through him, yet the world didn't know him. Think about this. He was a part of creation, but his own creation could not recognize him as creator. They were right next to him but didn't grasp the fullness of who he is. You can be in church settings. You can be around religious things. You can have religious music on, but if you're not grasping who he is, we're missing the whole thing. Every day I'm trying to grasp his presence, be in his presence. John says he was here and he was a part of the creation, but everyone missed it. John chapter 1, verse 17 continues on. It says, for the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. It's important because, again, we're writing Jews. You can keep this up for a second. We're writing to a group of Jews. John is clear. You read chapter 20. He kind of mentions a few things about why he wrote it. And he's writing to Jewish people to tell them the Messiah has come. You must believe this is the Messiah. This is the fight today. I studied under a messianic rabbi for about seven years. Had a privilege to study the Torah with him, all the Jewish customs. He's a messianic rabbi, though. So he believes, he's Jewish, but he believes Jesus is the Messiah. 
There's a bunch of Jewish people today, still Orthodox Jews, Hasidic Jews, all that stuff. They don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. They, they still are waiting for a Messiah to come. Is this helping y'all? Did you know that? So, so when, when John is trying to tell us is, you guys are used to the law, right? You know Moses. You know uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You know all that. But he goes, but make it clear, only the law came through Moses. God's love and faithfulness came through Jesus. No one has ever seen God but the unique one who is himself God and is near the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. What does that mean? When Jesus came, the fullness of who God is was revealed in that moment. God, God himself put on skin and bones. Message translation says, and he moved into the neighborhood. God himself cared enough to come and become one of us. God got tired of us trying to be like him, so he said, I'll just be like you so you can still be like me. He, he, he created the good news so that we could find hope and realize his presence is here and now. Every little thing about our Christian faith should remind you of something, shouldn't it? When we worship, we should be reminded of what God has done for us. When we pray, we should be thinking about what we want God to do for us. Um, when we look at the cross, we should be reminded of God's love for us. Some people look at the cross and they see sin. And they say, oh, that's where Jesus had to die for my sin. I see the love of God. I see God's love poured out. You ever seen just a real brutal picture of Jesus, thorns in his head, eyes swollen, blood coming down his face? I mean, that makes me uncomfortable. That is the fullness of how much God loves us. Let us not be reminded in the Christmas season, Jesus is coming as a baby to grow up and die for us. Christmas is fun, and it's the reminder of the birth of the king and all that, but he's here on mission. He's here to reveal God's presence here and now. So the gospel reveals his presence here and now. Thirdly, just from looking at John chapter 1, I think it's pretty clear Jesus is either received or he's not. If you've been with us here at Gospel any time, you've kind of heard us going this route here. You can't debate someone into being a Christian. You can't force someone into believing you, you, you can't make somebody grasp what you're trying to build. My wife and I have so much vision for this church, and we've yet to unveil all of it because we're just working with the first steps. Let me just a little bit at a time. Let me just a little bit at a time. Let me grow a little bit here at a time. But most of the times, we are so concerned trying to get people's approval and get them on board with our idea that we slow down. Jesus was clear. Look at verse 11. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. What I love about Jesus is he never let rejection slow him down. Can I prophesy over you today? Uh, no longer will people's approval or rejection of, their, of people slow down the vision God has given you. No longer should you be stuck because one or two people can't make sense of something God's spoken to you about. It's okay to let haters hate and you keep going. So he's either received or he's not. Either, either he, you, you're with him or not. You either crown him or you crucify him. I was talking to a student at Starbucks recently, just got into a conversation about Jesus. And, and I said, so let me ask you a question. What are your thoughts on Jesus? Oh, I think he's a great prophet. He was a great teacher. Uh, I think he was this, he was that. He was this, he was that. And I said, oh, that's great. He told me a bunch of stuff. I said, I keep noticing you keep saying was. Like he was a good teacher. Like he was, oh yeah, I think we can all agree that he lived a life but died and and he's, he's definitely played a good role. I said, so do you, do, you, do you believe in God? Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, all this kind of stuff. I said, oh, hold on a second, hold on a second, hold on a second. So, so Jesus was a good teacher. He said some good things. They're good for our political values if you're on one side or the other. Like, I understand your point, brother. Uh, but you're telling me you believe, but yet you're not recognizing him as king. You're not recognizing him as God. I said, friend, that's not, that's not Christianity. I don't, know what, well, I don't know what that is, but you, you, you can't just say, I'm a Christian, but yet Jesus isn't God. Are you with me? Yeah. So he's either received or he's not. There's no middle ground. There's no, like, I like him on some days and I don't like him on other days. Listen, I don't want to get up and pray and read and do that stuff all the time, but there is the beauty that God's going to receive me whether I want to or not. Yeah. And so he's either received or he's not. In chapter 5, G Jesus continues with this theme and he's talking to some Pharisees and Sadducees, and he's talking to some people, and he says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. I brought this up last week. We were talking about the Bible, 
and how we can't find value just from knowing scripture. We find value from knowing scripture that leads us to God, okay? It says, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Verse 41, I do not receive glory from people. What does that mean? Because we give glory to God. That's part of our faith, isn't it? Give God glory. Give God glory. Jesus just said, I don't receive glory from people. What is he trying to tell us? He, he, he's trying to tell us that like, whether we give him glory or not, he's going to keep going. Yeah. His point here is not whether people are accept him. The point is what I'm saying is true. And either you believe it or you don't. And man, it takes time, but there is something about truth always outweighing the need for our approval. Like truth is going to be truth whether you approve of it or not. If someone did something and you might have not liked what they did, but because they did it, that is truth and that cannot be changed. It is the same in scripture. Jesus has done something and that cannot be changed. It has happened. It is truth. So why do I fight for people's approval about my thing when all I'm trying to do is understand truth? You can be free from needing the approval from people. You can be free from living your life with an understanding, oh, I need people to get it and know me and do it. No, friends, we should have relationships, we should have friends, but if God has given you a vision, don't let the people that are here stop you from continuing to go there. Might be a business, might be a retirement plan, might be a plan to get married, have kids, whatever your thing is, there's gonna be plenty of people that are saying, marriage, why would you wanna get married? It's the new wave of the day right now is you don't need marriage anymore. Just play house, you'll be fine. When there are people here saying that. But over there is the fulfillment of following covenant and God blessing the things of covenant. Don't let the voices here stop you from going over there. So relationship brings light to your life, reveals God's presence. Jesus is either received or he's not. And lastly, number four, verse 12, real transformation comes from our connectedness connectedness from being connected our transformation our growth in life comes from the people we're willing to be around and grow with I used to think that transformation was a requirement just for me and I had to just kind of figure it out on my own so I would spend like you know hours just reading praying studying being alone and then realize like oh I need to do this with people because something happens when you open up God's word with a bunch of other people rather than just yourself. Something happens when you go to a church where there are other believers instead of just watching something on TV yourself. Something happens when you get in a group, when you join something bigger than yourself, you actually start to become like the thing you're a part of. Like our teams here, I was talking to our hospitality leaders this morning, like our teams here, we're not trying to get people on teams just so you can fill a spot. We want you to join a team so that you can be part of something. Like that, that, our teams out here, the kids team up there, it's not just a kids team. This is a group of women that are committing to grow together. They want to see God move in our children. They're praying for our kids' curriculum right now. They're praying for the spirit of the Lord to show us which kids' curriculum should we go through. How should we grow these kids? Because transformation doesn't just come from my own thing. It comes from our thing. If you want to go fast, go by yourself. But if you want to go far, go with someone else. If you want to get it done quick, Let's just get it done. I just want to get it done, get it finished. Let's do it. Let's do it. Go for it. It'll be quick. But if you want something that's going to last, something that will withstand the test of time, find some men and women that believe the same thing and say, can we do this together? Because I just feel like we can build something even better if we do it together. Could have had one guy build the stage and just said, hey, you could just take care of it, build it yourself. And I started meeting guys that like have wood shops or I met one guy in our community that was like, you know, I have a bunch of tools well, wouldn't we want to include everybody that has that skill set so we can do it together? Make something out of it together? Real transformation comes from connectedness. Look at verse 12. As I close, it says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's the right I fight for right there. The right to become children of God. So notice this. The ones that didn't receive him didn't have this right. If you did not receive Jesus, you said, no, you're not the Messiah. Well, you don't have the right to become a child of God. 
it, it, the, the, the Bible says it's adoption. When we believe in Jesus, we are adopted into his righteousness and we become a part of the family. So what John says is there were many people that didn't say yes to Jesus. Just like in our community, there will be many people that will not come to our church or any church out here. There will be many people that you will invite and they will laugh or you will ask to pray for them and they will say, you're weird. Or they will say, oh, you believe that stuff, your religion's so outdated. There will be many people. And I don't know, man, as a pastor, I, I've been around lead pastors and I've been studying lead pastors and I've, had, I've been in many churches, I've preached at churches, I've traveled, I've done all that stuff. And there's always this thing in leadership where it's like, well, you know, we just don't want people to leave us. Like, come to the church, but if they leave us, oh man, are you, like I had a church planner say, are you ready to get your heart broken? I was like, for what? I'm planning a church. It's going to be awesome. He's like, no, are you ready for people to leave you? And they're going to talk about you. And I'm like, what kind of conference is this? You know what I mean? Like, what kind of encouragement is this? But friends, I just want to start the church that way, saying, if they come to our church, they're not our people. They're God's people. This is the place that they choose to worship. Well, what if they go to other churches and they go to other churches? You know, I'm going to commit my life to the committed and the people that just want to come and attend, that's fine, they can come. Like, we're not going to kick people out of the church. Like, show me your church card, you know? Like, no. Because even if it means just one Sunday, someone sits in that seat and they're connected with other believers and they go, I didn't even know church could be like this. If all that's, if we're only supposed to do that one thing to bring transformation, then let's do it. Because John said many people came and went, but missed who he was. God forbid we'd be a church that people come and go and don't see Jesus. Don't see it forgiveness. Don't see someone genuinely saying, I can't do it without him. Don't see someone saying, I'm by myself, I can't do it. When people come through doors here or at the theater, let's be a church that's honest. Let's be a church that's real. Let's be a church that invites people to connect to a journey. The gospel connects us to Jesus Christ. It's, it's, it's technically, we say stuff like this. We say, if you want to accept the Lord today, you want to ask Jesus to come into your life. Close your eyes. I'm on the count of three. One, two, three, you know. And we say, well, if you want to ask Jesus to come into your life, if you want him to come into your heart, if you want him to come into your thing. And, and you know, I'm sorry. I, I just think that's backwards. Because yes, I want Jesus in my life, but to truly be saved, I actually have to come into his because when God judges sin, I don't want him judging my life because there's a lot of sin in it. I want him to judge me according to Jesus's life. So, theological term is called imputed righteousness, meaning when I step into his life, his righteousness covers me. It means all the stuff and all the junk and all the things I try to put forward doesn't matter. The writer Paul says we are hidden in Christ meaning that they can't, God can't even see what you've done when you say, Jesus, I'm first putting you in my life. How do I get transformed? I'll give you three quick steps for transformation. And these are our three steps that will never change as a church. When someone steps into our doors and they say, I want to be a part of this thing. These are the three things we just take them through. And if you're already gone through these three things, you just keep going through them after that. Number one is first believe the gospel. Our only step is just for someone to believe that Jesus came to earth, not just died for you, died as you. And now because of his death, you can live eternity with God. Just believe that. Do you believe that? I know sometimes we forget. That's why in church, we don't need to learn anything new. We just need to be reminded of what's true. But like when I believe the gospel, that means it changes how I believe in people. It means I changes how I believe in authority, it changes how I, how I believe in a, a virus, it changes how I believe in our economy. When I believe in the gospel, my belief in everything else is brought down a notch. I can still have it. You should still have beliefs. But when you believe the gospel, all of a sudden you start living with eternity in mind. And you're like, while I'm here, we need to care about this stuff, but may we never forget about what it's all about. May we never forget the arrow on the dashboard telling us it's right on this side. Believe the gospel. Second, belong to community. Belonging is hard because belonging requires consistency. It requires being vulnerable. It requires commitment. I have to commit to a group of people. What if I don't like them? Well, if they're a believer in Jesus, you better get to like them because they're going to be in heaven. You'll be around them a lot more up there. 
someone says, I don't know if I want to go to church with this guy. I say, well, if he really believes the gospel, you're going to see him anyways in heaven. You better get used to it now. But we belong to community, and then because of our community, we grow together, we're transformed together. And then it leads us to becoming not just a child of God, but I, I phrase it like this, becoming an apprentice. Y'all know what a disciple is, right? A disciple, someone who studied under Jesus, and discipleship has been a term that we've used in church before. I like the word apprenticeship more. Because an apprentice is someone who is prepared specifically for a, a task. If you're apprenticing under somebody, you are learning with the hopes that one day you will be doing. I want to become an apprentice for Jesus, whatever that means. Because people need the love of God. People need the forgiveness of God. And I would say people are craving forgiveness from their father more than they know. I read a story as I close up. Uh, in Madrid, Spain, just about a month ago, there was a father that took out a front page ad on the local newspaper. He lost his son. They hadn't talked in a few years. You could tell, like, just from reading the story, I was like, wow, this father's really trying to connect with his son. And uh, he basically took an ad out on the front page of the Madrid newspaper. And this is what the front page said. He put all his money into these words. Paco, meet me at Hotel Madrid at 2 p.m., all is forgiven. He took all the money he had and says, I'm going to try to find my son. And he said, Paco, meet me at Hotel Madrid at 2 p.m. All is forgiven. He gave him the date. And then a week later, he showed up at Hotel Madrid. And there were 800 young men there, all named Paco, that hadn't spoke to their fathers, that hadn't known what had happened to their dads and all is forgiven, drew them to show up at a place, whether they were gonna see their dad or not, they were craving the forgiveness of their dad. And can I tell you, there is a world that is craving forgiveness. They don't even know it, but they know I'm missing something. Yeah. Told a kid one time, said, you should come to our church. Oh, I haven't been to church in a while. Well, do you believe in God? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, do you ever miss him? And he looked at me like, miss him? Yeah, like, you ever miss him? You know, unconditional love, the acceptance of a father not based on your works, you know, grace for all the mistakes you've made, community, you ever miss that? Because people need the forgiveness of a father. So as a church, may we never be a place where that is not offered. That every week, people can run into this door knowing all is forgiven. We need to be healed. There's steps to healing and reconciliation. Can't wait to teach on reconciliation next year and just how that is so much like the heart of God to make things right. You know, if you need another reason to call somebody you haven't talked to in a while, life is short. Things happen quick. I want to be the type of person that's grateful for every person I see and that contributes to the vision God has given us. Like me and my wife, man, God spoke to us about this church. And there's people actually here that like believe in it that are like, pastor, we will follow you. Like, pastor, you just preached the sermon. We will take care of this. We will build that. Like, that's unbelievable. So as a community, we're gonna build a place where the forgiveness of God is always offered and it always received. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for this message. Thank you that sometimes we can miss the main thing, but when we are at peace, when we are undistracted, we can see you for who you are. If you're the, here this morning and, and you, you're craving forgiveness, you're craving God's forgiveness. The Bible is clear when we put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ, his righteousness, his perfection. The Bible says he became sin so that we who have sin could become righteous. If you're here today, the, the loving father is here and he's saying all is forgiven. After church on the way out, you have a chance to grab a card and give us your information if you want. I'd like to pray first for anybody that wants to give their life to Jesus. And if you're serious, if that's you and you're like, that's me, you'll fill that card out. I, I used to do like, lift your hands and let's do that. But then some people would lift their hands and then we'd never hear from them. So I want to be a place where we preach the gospel. And if you really need Jesus today, you'll respond uh, in that way. So Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for his love. I believe that he died for me. Today, I want to live for him. I believe he rose again, so today I rise again. I don't want to get distracted anymore. I want to know you and your righteousness over my life. 
I believe he rose from the dead as a statement of faith today. I take that into my heart and believe it as well. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen and amen. Come on, can we clap for anybody that made that decision today? So good. So good. Hey, a couple quick announcements before we close. Uh, we are going to receive an offering on the way out today. There's an offering uh, bucket there at the end. When we get into the theater, we're going to start training our usher teams. Um, most likely our ushers will just be holding those buckets at the doorway. And so when we dismiss in the theater, everyone can walk out. We'll have two people holding them by the doors. That'll kind of be our flow for that. Um, but thank you for your generosity. Thank you so much. We, we've already got the budget for everything we need to launch now. All Everything we raise now is just going into operating costs, paying rent at the theater. Um, you know, We've got our trailer. We've got our carts coming in a couple weeks. Kids has got a bunch of new equipment up there. And so... Y'all, we're really doing this thing. Like, people are actually giving money towards the house of God to make something happen. Um, and I think it's beautiful. So God bless you as you give today. If you're first time here, don't feel pressured to give or none of that. This is a service. This is a gift to you. Don't, don't feel obligated. But uh, for those of us that follow Jesus, we, we give because he's given. We give not to, like, bend the scales or balance everything out. We give as a response. Like, money doesn't have a hold on me. You know, well, I don't know how much I have. Give less than. If you can't give as much as you normally give, just give something. The Bible's clear. Give with the right heart, not with the right amount. I could preach amounts all day, but people aren't giving towards that. Give from your heart. What is God speaking to you about? So as a church, we'll never ask you for money. We're just going to ask you to talk to God about it and uh, let, let him do the rest. Um, secondly, we have our Christmas cookie exchange coming up, and uh, we're excited about that. So if you did sign up for the Christmas cookie exchange uh, at the table here, Miss Colleen, some of our hospitality team, they can get you next steps and all that. Um, if you want to join the cookie exchange, still plenty of cookies. So join. I would love to have some more cookies on the list. You know what I mean? Diversity in our people and in our cookies. Hello. Um, so we're excited about that. And it'd be good. Anything else? Kids church. Every week we're doing kids from here on out. So if you uh, have kids, feel free to bring them. Our check-in system is going to be over there. Um, if you'd like to join our kids team, we would love to have the help. We have some great women that if we don't tell them anything, they'll just serve every single day until Jesus comes back. So we want to try to balance it out. And if you'd like to help, uh, please let us know. It'll be good. So let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for this offering. Thank you for this tithe. Thank you for this day. Uh, as we dismiss, we just ask that you remind us that you're good. Even when life isn't good, you're still good. And so I bless every person in here and bless their minds, that their minds would stay above and not beneath. I bless their hearts this morning, that their hearts would remain pure, wouldn't get moved and swayed by the temptations of our world. I pray for their hands this week as they go to work and as they put their hands to the plow and whatever business or arena they're in, bless them, God, prosper them. Bless their feet this week, God, that whatever they walk is land you've given them, that they would walk by faith and not by sight. So we love you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. We love you guys. Have a great rest of your Sunday. We'll see you next week. And uh, be blessed.